Oof. Pacers get embarrassed on their home floor on Sunday night. What happened against the Orlando Magic? How did this happen? Could it happen again? Why did the third unit do so well at the end? We'll talk about all of it today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday, everybody. Hope you had a great weekend and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, oof, 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 we've got a tough one to break down. Pacers magic looks close. If you're tuning in because you see they lost by 12 and you don't know what happened, you are in for a doozy. Pacers embarrassed by the Magic on their home floor Sunday night, down by as many as 40-4-0 on their home floor against Orlando. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Why did this happen to the Pacers? How do they avoid this happening again? Did anything not go wrong? How do they avoid this going forward? Why it's so important that it doesn't happen again? And a little bit of positivity. The third unit was pretty good. Jordan Wara had a really nice game. We've got a lot to get to today. To lead, though, you have to start with this takeaway. If you are the Pacers basketball team, the league is really, the NBA, the league is really good this year. Really good. This is, I'm not talking about the Magic being good. This is not some like, oh, they played a good team and lost. The NBA is good this year. There are maybe one and a half just awful teams. Probably two, right? The Wizards are awful. The Pistons are awful. Everyone else is trying to win or be good. Maybe the Blazers too. 27 teams that are trying to win or are good or have some redeeming quality about them. And they all have goals to win or to reach the plan or to make the playoffs or something. There's, every night you're playing somebody with aspirations to beat you. The Pacers are one of those teams. They have aspirations of beating as many teams as they can to make the playoffs to make whatever they want to be a part of. They want to take a step forward as a team. They want to take a step forward as a franchise. They want to take a step forward as an organization. That's great. Those are all great goals for a team like the Pacers to have. Given how good the league is, that everyone's on their butt, they cannot have nights like this, right? Losing to the Magic is, it is not the end of the world. I mean, losing this badly in a way that, like, has you have to like think really hard about what happened how did this happen and reconvene and like that can't happen that cannot happen for a team like the Pacers who want to be as good as the Pacers want to be and it can't happen against a team that is right by you in the standings is on a parallel path to you but emphasizing the other side of the floor uh this this is just not a game that can happen for the Pacers it did and now the the caveats abound right the every team in the NBA will have two or three games like this during a season where the, everything just goes wrong all at once and have a complete avalanche, right? And the Magic are actually pretty good. <laughs> and the Pacers had all these days off for Russ. You could talk about every excuse in the book if you wanted, but the Pacers just were, were crummy for three quarters of basketball, horribly crummy, and they can't afford to be to be the team they want, especially against teams around them in the standings. And so I, I hear all the other parts of this, of the reasons that this game was what it was, but the Pacers, where they are, cannot afford to have games like this where they just get flat out embarrassed, embarrassed on their home floor. It happened right away, right? You blink, you miss it. Magic led wire to wire. Pacers never led. It was tied for a while because no one could score at the beginning, but the Magic were up 6-0 in just a couple seconds of the game, right? They were up 6-0 in two minutes. Timeout Pacers, that's okay. 6-0, they have Rusty, they haven't played in four days. And then... A minute later, it was 11-0. And then very quickly, it was 16 to 8. And then not much longer, it was 22 to 11. And then it was 27 to 13. And then it was 33 to 14. Rick Carlisle has to call three timeouts in the first quarter. Sorry, 35-14. And to just get the team together. They got doubled up 42-21 in the first quarter. What does that signal? Well, they're getting their butt kicked on both sides of the floor. They couldn't score at all. At all, 21 for this team that has the best, had probably not anymore, the best offense in the NBA entering the game can't happen. 42 is also terrible. The Magic had the 26th, I believe, maybe 25th 
rated offense entering this game in the league, right? The Magic have leaned into good defense, poor offense. The Pacers, the opposite. Well, in the first quarter, that clearly favored the Magic. But the Pacers, maybe they could turn around the second quarter, right? They score first. They strike first. No longer get double up. And no. Nope. The second quarter was just as putrid as the first for the Pacers. 36-23 second quarter, right? That is eight points better than the first quarter. A 36-23 quarter was an eight-point improvement towards the margin. That's how awful the Pacers were in the first half. So they were down 34 at halftime. I, I had to let that one sit for a second. I'm not good at pauses. That's probably my worst part of my talking skill is my pauses. But they they got their butt kicked to open this game. And you can point a finger in any sort of direction, right? They lost some rhythm. Certainly. Certainly not playing in five days. Four days since Tuesday. Whatever. doesn't matter. They lost some rhythm. Yeah. To me, this was about the magic size was a lot. And they were sending a lot of coverage at Tyrese Halberton. And the Pacers could not find an answer in a way that they normally do. Um, Halliburton, his worst statistical game of the season, 12 points. And 10 of them, eight of them, came in about two minutes to open the third quarter. So besides that, he did not actually score that much. He had he was 4 for 14 from the field, so he had 14 shots. He gets 12 points. He had two rebounds, three assists, four turnovers after this incredible run against Philly of 30-whatever assists, 32 assists, no turnovers. Sniffing his own record of assists without a turnover. He has more turnovers than assists. Shout out to Derek Kramer on the show last week for having the stat up. That's the first time that's happened to Tyrese Halberton since October 31st, Halloween of 2022. Over a year ago was the last time he had more turnovers than assists per Derek Kramer there. That's crazy. That never happens. Credit the magic, right? Tyrese was asked about this after the game. Like, why is this a thing that happened to you? Well, they were sending a lot of pressure at him. Teams do that, though. He is generally good at reacting to those things. Um, and making adjustments and either himself finding ways to score like he did in the third quarter. I think he was finding a groove to some extent in the second half. We'll talk about that. Um, or he can get other guys going, right? So they, he said, I thought they did a good job showing me bodies and forcing me to kick, and that's great. He did that. He had some turnovers against it, but their size really threw him off. The problem was no one else could either convert from his passes or make plays against a bent defense, right? Against Milwaukee and Utah last week, Ben Matherin could attack the bent defense. Against Philly this season and against, I think, the Cavs once, Obi Toppin was finishing plays. Uh, so multiple times, Miles Turner said, oh, I'm open, I'm going to score. Well, those guys were a combined 10 for 30 from the field for 30 points. 30 points on 30 shots is not going to cut it from the rest of those guys. Bruce Brown, to his credit, was effective. He didn't play that much because no one did. No one played more than 25 minutes for the Pacers because why would they? It was a blowout. Bruce Brown, to his credit, was effective in scoring in his own way. But if he's your most effective scorer, that says a lot about your offensive situation that you're in. They could not get Halliburton going. The other problem, though, was, okay, maybe you can afford that against the best defense in the NBA. They're going to slow you down. They're huge. Like, to the credit to the Magic, they are built to be like the anti-Pacers. Their three is Franz Wagner. He's way bigger than Bruce Brown. Boncaro's huge. Goga, former Pacer, started at center. He's big. They're bench guys. They bring in size everywhere to their credit. But that's like a slower team, and their offense kind of stinks. They don't really have a natural organizer. They rely on some rookies or some young guys. In fact, there are two starting guards in this game for the Magic. Jalen Suggs, Anthony Black combined, to be clear, for two assists in the game. The Magic had 21 assists tonight, and they won by this much. They didn't need it because the Pacers' defense, specifically in the post, was really rough. They could not stop this Orlando team. And that's where this game really was. If I'm the Pacers, a little concerning to me and Rick Carlisle noted it presser. He said, let's go talk about offense. We didn't guard them. We've got to defend better, right? Nobody defended well for the Pacers in this game to me, right? The, Jalen Suggs six for eight. He was fantastic as a score, 18 points. Van Caro had 24 on 14 shots. Franz Wagner, poor Bruce Brown just isn't tall enough. For a guy like that, 19 points on 14 shots for him. Gogo was three for five and got to the line. Anthony Black got to the line and had seven points on five shots. This is not supposed to be some really efficient team, but the Pacers could not stop them, could not stop them at all. It was really rough. And so I think their offense, yeah, their half court offense struggled. And that's going to happen. This is the first time a team's really gotten Halliburton to have a rough night. And it kind of spiraled to everybody, but the, the, that, couldn't that they couldn't respond on defense. 
was the most concerning part. Then they can't get in transition at all. They can't play their game. They're always taking the ball out of the rim, and that's why they gave up 78 in the first half to a team that they should be better than. Orlando had more fast break points than the Pacers. That says everything to me about this game. Pacers made it easy for them. I think they had 11 or 12 turnovers at halftime. To be clear, the Pacers averaged less than 13 turnovers per game entering tonight. They almost eclipsed it in the first half. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong for the Pacers, down 34 at the half. I believe there was a possession. I don't think it happened. Yes, I am correct. It did not happen. There was two possessions, actually, where the Magic had a chance to extend their lead to 40 in the first half of this game. Every single player on the Pacers had a poor first half. They weren't ready to go. They looked lackadaisical. They couldn't get into what they wanted. They couldn't defend. They, everything went wrong. And this, this can't happen for what the Pacers want to be, for where they want to go. That cannot happen. And so it, it's tough with these games. They play Tuesday in season tournament. They've played well in those. Atlanta, another team like Orlando that if you're the Pacers, you have to be competitive and beat sometimes right in your position. On one hand, it's good. They can flush it, forget it. Oops, that stunk. Move on. That is a good thing about the NBA. On the other hand, you kind of have to like sit with a game like this and go, what the heck happened to us? How did this happen? We have to be better. They have to be better on Tuesday. What else went wrong? Well, we can keep going. Pacers smoked by the Magic. Plenty more to dissect from this game as, as plenty of guys could not get going and the stops were really rough. And statistically, the fouls, 32, the most the Pacers have had all season. Why did that happen? We've got plenty more to dissect going forward here on the Locked on Pacers podcast. Before we talk about all that, I need to really quickly talk to you guys about the wonderful people over at Prize Picks Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's simple. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections. Watch your winnings roll in. For example, Will Tyrus Halbert, more or less than nine and a half assists in a game. That's how prize picks works. Maybe not that exact line, but something like that. And you can do that for a bunch of players or a bunch of stats combined together or a new thing. You can do the specials league, which combines sports. For example, combined LeBron and Travis Kelsey, 10 and a half combined threes made plus receptions. They have a reboot policy, so your entries stay relevant even if one of your players you picked gets injured. Price Picks is the best. It's an absolute blast. You've got to try it. Go to pricepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA and use the code LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Heck yes. Pricepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use that code LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100 at Price Picks Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. Back here on Locked On Pacers. Thank you as always. For making us your first listen today and every single day for a second listen, check out Philip Rossman Reich on Locked On Magic. Hear about the other side of this. Another ascending East team. Lots of good young talent. Best defense in the NBA entering the night. Matt Pacers did actually score enough in the fourth that they might have knocked the Magic off the pedestal of best defense in the NBA. But it was all because of the fourth quarter. It was not because of the... People use this term a lot. Competitive portion of the game. And I like that because I know what it means. But it also implies that the Pacers were competitive for this parts of this game. And they were not competitive as early as like the middle of the first quarter. Um, what they're really saying is like when normal rotation players were playing, which was like three and a half quarters, uh, excuse me, two and a half quarters to be clear. Everything went wrong for the Pacers. Lots of stats you can point to. I mean, I, I even tweeted at halftime. I'm not even going to tweet stats, right? Like all of them favor the magic. <laughs> Every single one. The turnover one was really interesting because the Pacers cleaned this up and they actually ended up getting close. 16 turnovers to the Pacers, 15 for the Magic. That's fine, right? And it's not Tyrese Halliburton had four. That's very uncharacteristic of him. Everybody else who had the turnovers is like guys who do have some turnovers every so often, whatever. You're not thrilled about that if you're the Pacers, right? But against the Magic specifically, who aren't the highest powered offense ever, in fact, very weak on the offensive end, the possession battle matters a great deal. And so to lose one there... And then to also lose the rebound battle, barely, but still, to lose the rebound battle, that's tough for the Pacers because they, they need more possessions against a team like that that's going to cause them troubles. And so if you look at the shot attempts, Pacers shot eight more shots. It looks like they did a good job in the possession battle. Magic, 87 shots. Pacers, 95. The difference is the Magic took 11 more free throws in this game. So the possession battle, very close to even. Pacers did a pretty good job to get that close to even, but they needed to be ahead against a team like this that defends so well. You need lots of chances to crack that code, and they didn't have it in this game. Turnovers were a big part of that. 
Rick Carlisle on Saturday when I was talking to him about the Magic, uh, we were also talking about the possession game and how important it could be for the Pacers against a team like that where your margin of error drops a lot. Their size and physicality is tough for the Pacers. They are a tough matchup. To the Magic's credit, they are a tough matchup for the Pacers. But that specifically is something he highlighted, and it did not go the Pacers' way. It's probably pretty close to even, and it needed to be in the Pacers' favor. Turnover is a big culprit there. Rebounding, I would not have expected the Pacers to win. Pacers, other stuff that was statistically important. Eight for 31 from deep. Only one Pacer made more than one three in this game. It was Jordan Wara, who we will talk about for a few minutes in the third segment. Best game of the season by a mile. Great game for Jordan Wara. Credit to him. He was ready to play. They were pulling all the strings in this game, Carlisle was, trying to find somebody, some lineup that had any juice, anything. Jordan Wara played in the first half and was okay. Jordan Wara played in the first half of this game, so when the Magic were dominating, and he was a plus 18 for the whole game. You know, he also mostly played in the fourth quarter, but still, that's impressive. TJ McConnell played in both halves, and he was a plus two. Credit to him as well. But either way, Jordan Wara had a very good game. He hit two threes. Nobody else made more than one. That's a brutal thing for the Pacers. They are trying to create threes and make threes. They could not do it in this game. But the stat that's going to tell it all to me, the thing the Pacers did worse than they have in any other game this season, statistically, the fouls. 32 fouls for the Pacers in this game. It, it was unbelievable. And thirty. Tyrese Halliburton was not happy. Uh, well, <laughs> Let me be clear. Tyrese Halliburton did not say he was not happy with the officiating. He did a very good job dancing around that. He said, uh, he he jokingly was saying, I'm paraphrasing, everybody needs to be better on the floor. And he was implying like the Pacers and the officials. So he was he didn't say that. Credit to him for being diplomatic. Um, 30, but 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 to walk that back a bit. I, I do think the Pacers fouled a lot in this game. Like, okay, whatever. I, I'm never an officiating guy. Uh, 32 fouls is a ton. Halliburton thought the Pacers should have been at the line more than they were. Uh, he only attempted three free throws himself. 32 fouls for the Pacers. As I keep going on tangents about how the Pacers felt about the officiating. I don't like talking about officiating. 32 is their most in a game this season. Let's be clear. The last three games the Pacers played before tonight, they went against Joel Embiid, great at drawing fouls and getting to the line and did so against the Pacers. Before that, they played Embiid again. Same thing. And then before that, they played Giannis, who always gets the line against them and had, I think, 18 free throws against them. A lot. Uh, made 16 of them. In, against Philly, uh, in the win, they fouled 28 times. and lost, they fouled 14 times. And then when they beat Milwaukee, they fouled 25 times. 25 and 28 are the two times before tonight that the Pacers had fouled the most in a game. And then tonight against the Magic, who don't have anyone awesome at getting to the line, 32 fouls. And they were all in the interior. And a lot of them were legit like we have to foul to stop these guys because they're on the fast break or they're under the basket buried with a good chance to score or just some dumb fouls. But the Pacers fouled way, way, way too much. And so the Magic got 42 free throw attempts in this game. That's almost insurmountable to go against. They made 35 free throws. Pacers only made 24. Like that's obviously the score margin is not reflective of what happened in the game. It was not a 12 point game, but that's an 11 point difference in a 12 point game, right? Like if you wanted to dumb it down that much, okay, you could. Um, for the season that so far, as I accidentally go to player stats and not team stats, for the season entering this game, before this game actually happened, the Magic were near the top of the league in free throw attempts per game. In fact, they were second, 27.2 per game. This is something they do, but that's a lot of fouls. In fact, the most per game any team in the league is averaging in fouls per game is the Pistons entering the night at 24, Pacers at 32 in this game. That's brutal. That's the most they've had in a game this year. Certainly something they would like to clean up going forward. I could go on and on with stats about how poor the Pacers played in this game. Their bench shot it. Okay. McConnell was over 50% from the field. War was well over 50%. Jalen Smith was over 50%. Jairus Walker was at 50% and played 14 minutes and they were okay. Like they had a lot of good stuff uh, happen offensively off the bench. Offensively, to be clear. Defensively, pfft, nope. That group couldn't solve it either. Nothing was going right for the Pacers in this game. And I think the main culprit, it was the defense. They could not stop the Magic. When the Magic had their main guys out there, they absolutely could not stop them. When the Magic subbed to kind of, you know, go to their deeper units in the third quarter, they went up 40. I'll try to find the exact time um, for reference. They went up 105-65 with 3.30 to go in the third quarter. 
And then there were some subs about 30 seconds later, right? So game changed pretty quickly. And then more deeper bench guys came in for the fourth quarter. Pacers could not stop the magic at all. They couldn't stop fouling. It was the worst part of their defense. They were late on their rotations. They couldn't stop guys in the post. They couldn't stop fouling guys in transition, which sometimes you have to do to get a decent stop. They could not get stops, and they resorted to fouling. It was a horrible, horrible performance for the Pacers in every way. And now they're 7-5. and five. Their momentum from their big wins in two of their last three are kind of gone, and they've got some tough games coming up pretty soon. They have two medium ones, two easier ones, and then a tough schedule. Tonight would have been a good win for them against a good team. Instead of getting it, they looked brutal. Tough loss for the Pacers. There were some silver linings, some silver linings in the fourth quarter, stuff that the Pacers will hope can carry forward either if they need it or long-term. That is always what is more important for a young team like this, although the short-term is, still, of course, important to them. We will talk about that to close out Today's show, Jordan wore a ball and Jarris Walker playing and playing kind of good. Ben Shepard doing some stuff. Still a lot to talk about here on the Locked On Pacers podcast, but not until I talk to you guys about the great people over at FanDuel. The NFL is rolling. The Colts were off this week, so they didn't lose on Sunday like the Pacers did right now. New customers on FanDuel, where you can bet on the NFL, get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's on America's number one sports book, and that's a lot of money. $5 money line bet, you win, boom, 150 bucks if your team wins. Heck yeah, if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now with the NFL going, NBA's rolling, NHL's on its, is, is headway in their season. Perfect time to get in on all the action. Their app, it's super easy to use. They have a wide range of betting options. They've got your player props. They've got your spreads. They've got your over-unders. They've got your faves, whatever. It's all there on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season over on FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. Back here on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. I just watched this game. So, hey, hop on over to Locked On Lakers, who just beat the Rockets, who are good. That's actually an impressive win. And LeBron was awesome. LeBron played 39 minutes at age 38 and was fantastic against Dylan Brooks. Heck yeah. Love storylines like that. Locked on Lakers for your second lesson. You're interested in the Hollywood show that is the LA Lakers. Okay. The silver lining, if you want those. Second half score. Magic 50. Pacers 72. Somehow, the Pacers won the second half by 22 points in a double-digit loss. There were so many banana snakes. The Pacers' fourth quarter was phenomenal. 38 points scored that only allowed 21. They actually won the third quarter, which did feature a lot of starters' time. Halberton's start was pretty good. Bruce Brown kept doing his thing. Mather made some okay plays. McConnell was doing stuff. Jalen Smith made his shots. Aaron Neesmith hurt his shoulder. We'll see what is up with that. He came back to the bench. We didn't hear anything about it. But either way, they did some actually like good stuff. In the third quarter, you can see where they chip in the lead just after halftime, and then the Magic get it up to 40, and then the Pacers take it back down. They had a good third to their credit. Why did they have a good third, and why did they have an awesome fourth where they took the lead down from as much as 35 down to – they they had a chance, I believe, two actually. I will double-check while I'm talking – to get this to single digits. They had the ball with a chance to do so. Um the exact times, yes, the Pacers had the ball at 113-124 with a minute to go. Had they scored, it would have been a less than 10-point game. They Again, they, they would have lost. It was still insurmountable. But the fact that they even had that chance says a lot about their fourth quarter, given they were down 40 with 15 and a half minutes to go, right? They did play well in the fourth. It was reserves against reserves. This was not the same guys who struggled in the first two and a half quarters, but it was still impressive performances, especially to mount that level of comeback in that frame. Like I was, I, I was going to stick with my headline for the game, no matter what, to, just to peek you under the hood of writing. Right. I wrote in the third quarter, I could do the headline. They're getting smoked. Right. Pacers embarrassed by Orlando magic on their home floor. And they started to come back and I was like, am I going to have to change this? No, they got embarrassed either way. Thankfully I didn't have to change it. But like, if I had done blowout, I couldn't have kept that. If I had written something about it being their second biggest loss of the season, besides that game in Boston, well, if, if they got it under 11, it would have been better than the Philly game last week. And all of this nonsense that I'm sharing with you now is because of the fourth quarter where their reserves were really good, really good. This starts with Jordan Wara. 
full credit to Jordan Wara. I wrote a piece about him earlier this week just because we caught up with him early in the season, and he, he hasn't played hardly at all this year. I think this was his fourth game, fifth game. He hasn't played hardly at all, and it makes sense. Everything the Pacers did at the four makes sense, but Wara played well for them last year. It's just a s- bummer situation for him. Um, He played a bunch, 23 minutes and 11 seconds, and boy, did he play, right? Made it, Only guy to shoot well from three, two for five. 8 of 11 from the field, which means, if you're good at math, 6 for 6 on twos. He made every two-pointer he took. He made his only foul shot. He got five rebounds. He had an assist. He had two steals. Jordan Wara was really good in this game and did all the stuff that he did last year for the Pacers that everybody was like, wow, this guy's way better than he was for the Bucks, and he can do all the stuff and add to his game and move a little bit better. He lost like 10 pounds in the offseason, right, so he could be more mobile. You could see it in this game. It was definitely his best game of the season, without a doubt. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that if you're a guy who's just outside the rotation trying to earn playing time, earn minutes in your fourth game, you need a game like that, right? Entering the night, he was six for 18 from the field this season. Basketball reference says 33% from the field. Well, now he's 14 for 29. He's almost at 50% from like, that's, it, it's crazy what one good night can do in your situation. His season looks way better now. Uh, at least statistically, right? He's four for 12 from deep. Now that's way better. His uh, per games are going to go way up. That stuff doesn't really matter to the Pacers winning, but to have that kind of guy on your bench to be needed at some moments, like they turned to him in the second quarter. They needed any juice in this game. He was really good. So that's something for the Pacers to note. If they need Jordan Wara, he's ready. They needed TJ McConnell in this game because Andrew Nemhard was hurt, right? Are you going to need Jordan Wara for similar situations? Maybe Aaron e. Smith's hurt. Who knows what that shoulder thing will be if they need Jordan Wara to fill in? Well, look at that. They have very good, very recent example that he's ready to do that. He was really good in this game. Credit to him. He was a leader in that fourth quarter, uh, which the Pacers needed. Some other guys who were good. Isaiah Jackson was freaking brilliant. Um, the stats don't bear it out perfectly. He only took two shots because he got fouled so much. Six free throw attempts. He finished with six points on two shots. He had four rebounds. This is all in the fourth quarter. He played the whole fourth quarter. Uh, Four rebounds and assists, three steals and a block. He was awesome on both ends. Rick Carlisle singled him out after the game. Every time Isaiah Jackson's touched the floor this season, when he's been needed, he's been solid and filled in role and and looked good. Again, I said this, I believe, last week, but like he's got to be kicking himself for that preseason he had when he had a chance to earn the backup center job, but he didn't because when he's played, that was his sixth performance. He's played in half their games now. He's pretty much been good to solid to better in all of them. And credit to him in this one. He was good. And then the rookies, the guys who deserve the longest amount of time in the silver lining section, both played solid games. Ben Shepard. They turned to Ben Shepard in the first quarter. That's how much the Pacers were getting their butt kicked. Now, he's probably their 10th guy tonight uh, with, with Nemhard out anyway. But they turned to Shepard really early because he can space and he's mobile enough on defense. He was a plus 25 because he played in the fourth quarter. But he also played in competitive part of the game and still had a good plus minus. They did okay at the end of the first quarter. Two assists, two steals, two for five from the field for seven points for Ben Shepard. He is certainly a depth piece uh, as a late first rounder. But every time he plays, he looks like he belongs, at least in the league. And the guy that everybody wants to see play more. And I want to talk about something I keep seeing from fans. Rick Carlisle tweeted after the game. or (laughs) I tweeted about Rick Carlisle's quote after the game, where Rick Carlisle said, let's quit talking about offense. We didn't guard them. We've got to defend better. A couple responses to that or messages from people who said, why don't you play Jarris Walker if that's the case? Look, Jarris Walker was an awesome defender at Houston. I'm not going to dispute that at all. And I think he will be a really good defender in the NBA. I was really high on Jarris Walker, right? I thought that should have been the pick for the Pacers, and it was. But he has not been a good defender yet in the NBA. Defense in the NBA is harder than college, much harder. And the... You know, Kaylin Cooper laid this out pretty well um, on her Twitter feed a couple weeks ago. But like his only significant, significant minutes that Boston game, he did not defend well in that fourth quarter at all. Right? He has not had a, a like defense. He's like a defensive playmaker, and that's good. But like the totality of his defense isn't quite there. That said, they, I did turn to Dustin Dopierak in the second quarter of this game. Pacers are getting smoked, and the size was killing them. The magic size was killing them. I said, this kind of this is the Jarris game. Like, if you're gonna go to him in an important game, this is it because they have so much size, and he's maybe their best size answer off the match. And they did that. Jarris Walker did play during actual competitive moments of this game in the second quarter, and then playing a ton in the fourth. Uh, and he had a nice game. He he had his shooting looks ugly, right? He had some yucky 
two yucky threes that did not get close. But he drilled a foot on the line, too. If he had had it behind the line, that would have changed how people feel about his shot a little bit. He made all of his two-pointers, three for three on twos. He had a beautiful assist. He continues to have these in-the-lane beautiful lobs to Isaiah Jackson for an assist and a steal and a block. That's the defensive stuff I like. Seven points on six shots, plus 15. I don't know how much he can play. I don't know how they're going to get him to play. It sounds like at some point when the calendar allows for it, he'll play in the G League, which is smart. Um, ben Shepard presumably will too when that happens, but they were both solid in this game. Showed why, at least, the Pacers believe they'll be NBA contributors at some point. So that third unit that they closed with, Shepard, Walker, Wara, Jackson, and then at times it was McConnell, at times it was Matherin until he found out, fouled out, excuse me, like they they had this third unit that was awesome. That group played really good. That group deserves a ton of credit. And the Pacers' depth is awesome. This is something that's been talked about all year. Those guys are ready when they need them. But for the actual part of the game, with the rotations and game plan being played, the Pacers got their butt kicked. They got absolutely their butt kicked all night. And they've got to be better. They cannot have games like this. They need to be better. They need to play the magic again, I think, so they can show that they can be better because everybody could have played a better game. I think in the first half, Bruce Brown was really the only guy I would say had a good half. Bruce Brown had a good first half. Credit to Bruce Brown. Everybody else could have been better. Jalen Smith had a good first half, too. Everybody else could have been better and needed to reach a higher standard for the Pacers from our seven and five and a back-to-back coming up later this week. They've got the Hawks Tuesday in season tournament action. The way the action shook out on Friday is now the case that if the Pacers beat the Hawks, they win their group. That's it. Doesn't matter what happens in their last game. That's huge. That means they'll be in the quarterfinals of the tournament. So a lot riding on that game, which means we have to talk to a Hawks guy. Brad Rowland from Lockdown Hawks will be on here tomorrow talking Hawks, talking Trey Young and Tyrese Halliburton, talking in season tournament. Lots of fun stuff coming there. Brad is the best. And then we'll talk about that game Wednesday. Look ahead at the Raptors and Thanksgiving. I like to do two or three guests a week, but with the holidays, it's going to be pretty tough this week. So maybe just that one. We'll see how the week shakes out or what I can have, but lots of fun games coming fun time for the Pacers. And you know, we'll have all the coverage here on the locked on Pacers podcast. Thank you guys a ton for listening today. Have a fantastic rest of your Monday. I'm on Twitter at Tony R East. The show is at locked on Pacers. We will see you soon.